I think a lot of this comes down to the fact that all of our old understandings about gold might be out the window. Welcome to the Gold Exchange Podcast, where we untangle market and policy complexity using timeless economic principles. For show notes and archives, go to goldexchangepodcast.com. My name is Ben Nadelstein. I am joined by the General Counsel of Monetary Metals, Jeff Dice. Jeff, how are you doing this morning? Ben, I am fantastic. How are you? Jeff, what's on your mind? We've seen a lot of headlines recently with gold. Wanted to get your take. Yeah, I've been following a lot of the big gold social media accounts and just some of the general commentary around, you know, what's behind the, the price increase, especially in Q1 2024. And there's a lot of different theories about it. Uh, but there's also some real discrepancies in the sense that in the West, we see a pr pretty slim demand for physical if you talk to the actual bullion dealers, there's not a lot of people buying in the West. We also see outflows from ETFs in the West. And generally, uh, Western financial advisors, by West, I basically mean Western Europe and the US, Western financial advisors are still, for the most part, advising, let's say, a 1% position, whether that's in physical or whether that's in some sort of paper uh, ETF or future, whatever it might be. So uh, we, you know, we have to understand where is this price action. I think a lot of it, obviously, is in central bank buying, um, and there's some good people to follow if you're interested in that. Um, a, a friend of mine named Mike Meharry, who works for uh, Money Metals Exchange, follows that, and, and you can follow him on Twitter, for example. Uh, but there's also probably some churn in the paper futures market, uh, to be sure. But I think a lot of this comes down to the fact that. All of our old understandings about gold might be out the window. And what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is I think we're, we're entering a new era and we haven't been in anything like this for really for over 40 years. And I'm talking about basically the early 1980s until right about COVID, till about 2022, we had a four decade period of declining interest rates. And so when we're talking about gold, you know, people talk about whether it's a safe haven whether it's the inflation hedge and all these other things. What I'm suggesting, I don't know, but what I'm suggesting is we might be entering an era where the underlying price of gold is decoupled from a lot of these fundamentals to which we tied it in the past. In other words, what if in this new era, the price of gold is no longer tied to interest rates, whether central bank rates, prime rates, commercial rates, whatever you want to look at, what uh, overnight lending rates, what if it's no longer tied to CPI? What if it's no longer tied to the equity and bond markets or GDP or unemployment or general sentiment? In other words, there's all kinds of ways that gold might be decoupling from all of these standard metrics. And I would argue that that is because it is increasingly seen as a safe haven asset. And I think a safe haven is a very different thing than an inflation hedge per se. And, and one way to think about that is when you say inflation, people think CPI. And so there would be an easy metric to test, which would be the CPI versus the gold price. And if there was some correlation, whether that's causation or correlation, between the gold price rising or falling and CPI rising or falling, and if one stays stagnant, ideally mm -hmm. with this framework or, or this narrative, the other should stay stagnant. And when you look at gold prices, that's kind of hard to see in the data. One might say that in the 1970s, when there was high inflation and, and gold prices were rising, that could just be the gold price, you know, leaving its bottled up price fix when it was actually fixed at an amount per dollar, and then just kind of exploding to where the market price or the market clearing price should have been all those years. So that's one argument in the 70s. Yes, inflation and gold kind of moved together, but that's just because of other reasons, not, not because of CPI inflation. And then the 80s and 90s, that correlation, not super strong, right? You, you see inflation, but mm -hmm. gold prices don't necessarily track the same way. And then in the 2000s and, and in the 2010s, again, that story kind of there, kind of breaks down. Uh, and now, of course, in, in the 2020s, there's a question of, okay, we've had high inflation in, in the beginning of the 2020s. Gold price stayed relatively slow and stagnant. And now in the, in the 2024s, you're seeing a rise in gold price hitting all-time highs, while inflation is not reaching new all-time highs. Uh, and some people think cooling. Paul Krugman famously saying, you know, everything but your food, shelter, energy, uh, anything that you could buy, that, that's, all, that's all cooling. But it, it seems like there is a disconnect with inflation. 
Another narrative has been, okay, well, yes, maybe gold doesn't move with inflation. It's not an inflation hedge, but maybe it moves with, with interest rates, whether you know real interest rates or just nominal interest rates. And again, I think in, in 2024, that narrative has been not debunked for certain, but that decoupling, like you mentioned, is, is seemingly much more likely because with 5.5% target Fed funds rate at the peak, uh, we, we've seen the gold price rise. And so most analysts say gold has no income. And so the opportunity cost of holding gold while treasuries, T-bills, or bonds pay 5.5%, clearly on the margin, investors might think, well, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll jump into T-bills, maybe I'll sell some gold. Now, at mm -hmm. Monetary Metals, we do pay a yield on gold paid in gold. So now there is an interest rate in gold. Again, it's unaffected by the Federal Reserve and the Federal Reserve's interest rate. So for some investors, that actually might be something where they say, well, you know, if I can earn 5% or 3% or 2% on gold, that matters much less what the federal funds rate or the target rate is. Um, and then, of course, there's that question of store of value, right, purchasing power, which I think most people weren't born in the 1900s, so they don't have an affinity for a 25 cent can of, of soup or a 50 mm -hmm. cent steak. And so that's maybe not a strong argument. So this flight to safety might be the new narrative. Where do you see investors or other clients thinking, OK, if I'm looking for a flight to safety, maybe people are looking at Bitcoin. But how do you see gold in that in that kind of new light? Well, I think that the safe haven concept for owning gold is more powerful than the inflation hedge. Now, I'll go back to a couple of the metrics you mentioned. I mean, if we go back historically, gold has not always tracked inflation, you know, point by point. The other problem in that understanding is that there's more than one kind of inflation. Uh, our friend Lynn Alden wrote a great article, you know, documenting the three kinds of inflation, which basically price inflation, asset price inflation, and monetary inflation. So we have to talk about which kind we're talking about. And so when even Larry Summers, of all people, comes out and says, you know, the way we used to calculate CPI back in the 70s and 80s, if we applied that today, it'd be a lot higher. So let's say inflate real price inflation, when you consider insurance and housing and tuition, medical care, you know, go try to get homeowner's insurance. And if you're a renter, guess what? Your landlord is going to have that reflected in your rent. I mean, there's a lot of ways in which prices really are going up. And so we might argue uh, cynically that the government is not very truthful and that real inflation is something more like 10%. If you look at it that way, you know, even gold's 2024 rise is not all that great as an inflation hedge. So we have to understand what we're talking about. Keith Weiner is also quick to point out a lot of this is COVID related. I mean, there were, you know, supply chain shutdowns, what he calls mandatory useless ingredients, you know, things that green energy legislation uh, require, that, that sort of thing. Uh, you know, there's lots of reasons for prices to go up apart from the, the per se fiscal or monetary machinations of any government or central bank. So we got to understand that as well. Inflation is not such a simple thing to understand. Uh, if we flip that mentality a little bit to the safe haven idea, I mean, an inflation hedge is a particular asset that is supposed to go up in value against or ahead of inflation right? A safe haven asset by contrast, and there can be a lot of overlap. It can be the same asset in some cases, but a safe haven asset, we can define more as an asset that performs well in some sort of, uh, not catastrophic, but some sort of problematic uh, financial turmoil, right? A, a crash of 2008 uh, and a, a crash of 1987, uh, you know, an event like 9-11, an event like COVID, so we all understand the safe haven concept. And actually, Mark Spitznagel, who uh, runs the hedge fund universe, I mean, that's called a tail risk fund. It's a very unique and mathematical beast. But nonetheless, his central thesis, and matter of fact, his most recent book is called Safe Haven. And if you can plow through the math, which was a little challenging for me, you can actually apply a lot of his insights into your own uh, yeah. personal investing. But uh, the idea here is that if you keep your losses to a minimum, year after year after year after year, when that black swan or, or, or terrible event comes along, uh, you make a killing that more than covers all of your small losses over the years. And as a hedge fund manager, that's kind of tough. You got to have clientele who are willing to, to stick with you. But because of Spitznagel's track record, he does have that clientele. Uh, and so when COVID came along in March of 2020, Q1 of 2020, uh, at least one of Spitznagel's funds made something like 4,000%. Yeah. 
in a single quarter. So that's, you know, that's that's kind of a unique game. And it's probably not something that most average investors want in their personal life. We all want to sleep at night. And and Mark Spitznagel is obviously a brilliant quant. We're all not wired like that. Uh, but the, still the safe haven concept, the idea that, hey, look, you know, I don't have to be some perma bear. I don't have to think gold's going to 5,000. And that might be a very unpleasant world where, where it did. Uh, I don't have to think that the world is going to get so tired of the Congress's deficits and they're going to stop buying our treasury debt and and uh, treasury is going to have to offer junk bond rates to get anyone to buy this crap. We don't have to believe that there's going to be a catastrophic implosion in the dollar or hyperinflation. We don't have to believe that there is going to be a severe economic depression in the U.S. or the West. We don't have to believe any of these things to own a safe haven asset. We just have to believe that in history, these things have happened. And, you know, if you, uh, you if you want to protect yourself and your family, it might be worthwhile to hold something uh, that you think is going to perform well in that kind of scenario. And I think one way to frame this is, OK, let's say there's a new rule coming out saying, you know, we're no longer allowed to use Ubers or Airbnbs in Seattle or New York City. And, and that's very plausible. You mm -hmm. can understand why the price of those you know services could go up why the gold price would appreciate on that news is unclear to me. I, I don't, I'm not sure what the causation would be or even the correlation. Now, something like the depreciation of the currency, the lira in Turkey, I could see where the gold price actually does have a one-to-one -one causation, or if you want to say correlation, with the price of the lira going down or the price of gold going up. So I could understand that. And that well, would, to me, seem like a safe haven narrative, which is that you are trying to save yourself from the debasement of the currency of the lira and much less likely to say, well, you know, Uber and Airbnb are more expensive. Therefore, why is my gold price not increasing? Well, the other thing is you have to take a long term view. Calamities can unfold over a decade. They can unfold over two decades. How do you define a calamity? 9-11 is a calamity. Uh, but what's happened to the Turkish people over the last 10 years? I mean, you go back to 2011, a little more than a decade ago. Uh, the lira was basically two to one against the euro. Fast forward to 2024, it has gotten as high as about 20 to one against the euro. So I would argue that that's a calamity. And I would argue that if you were a Turk and throughout all those years, you had been converting your paycheck in, from lira into gold, you'd be you know, relative to your compatriots, a, a happier camper today. So, um, you know, the idea of a safe haven asset doesn't always have to mean some, you know, uh, immediate or instant shock. It can mean a long-term trend. And, and on that point, um, let me read you a quote. This is from our friend John Hathaway at Sprott. Now he's talking about there's sort of a, a new understanding, which I would argue is, is, is accelerated even since 2008, when a lot of Americans really started to question, you know, the banking system, the U.S. dollar, uh, the fairness of the economy, inequality, a housing, whether I'm ever going to be able to buy a house, whether I'm ever going to be able to retire. I mean, that was a real period of, of reckoning, I think, for the American psyche. And let's not forget gold markets, physical and paper, are, you know, they're a reflection of human beings, even traders, even, even algorithmic traders, because someone programmed the algorithm. Okay, they they're they're not these hyper-rational robots. And they have a psyche, they have greed, they have fear, they have all kinds of behaviors baked in. And so that's the market in which we have to respect the market and, and its signals and what it's telling us. Um, and so over time, as these body blows to the U.S. psyche uh, build, you know, we, uh, in my opinion, anyway, Iraq and Afghanistan didn't go too well. We had the housing crisis of 2008. Uh, we, we've had, you know, uh, COVID lockdowns. We've had... Uh, a lot of shocks over the, the past couple of decades. And over time, you know, people begin to wonder, is the United States and its economy and its dollar, uh, even its military, are these paper tigers of, of a sort? So here's John Hathaway at Sprite. He says, loss of trust in the U.S. dollar is a safe and useful asset is no longer a hypothetical concern. Now, I certainly agree with uh, Brent Johnson at Santiago uh, about the immediate or near-term futures of the dollar, but I, I might agree with John Hathaway on the long term. So he says, abandonment of the U.S. dollar is a reality. The pace is picking up steam. Eh, maybe. But there are numerous potential catalysts for the general rush into gold by the investment mainstream. A few include the intractable fiscal position of the U.S. I believe that. All things ge geopolitical, resurgence of inflation connected to rising oil prices, and a, an impotent and mistake-prone Fed. That is not the way people talked about the Fed when I was a young person. 
and an unnerving setback in the overvalued and overconcentrated stock market, um, you know, the investment public may no longer re remain asleep to these risks. So, you know, sometimes things can be cumulative. And I think that was what happened in Turkey. They borrowed an awful lot of money at the governmental level in lira, excuse me, in euro and dollars, not in lira. And they use those to fund huge infrastructure projects like airports and highways and all that. And that boosts your GDP. And people were talking about the Turkish economy, uh, you know, 09, 10, 11. But then when the bills come due. And so you get the sense that there's a, a fatigue amongst the American public, especially when they're out seeing their, their paycheck rise uh, slower than inflation or their net worth rise slower than inflation. And I, I think a lot of these body blows go to the psyche of the uh, the gold market. I think they, they're reflected there. I'd like to end with a couple of questions for you. So like we mentioned, you know, you don't have to be a catastrophic doomsayer to say, hey, I think it might be a good reason to have some gold in a portfolio if this safe haven narrative continues to come to fruition. One of those is the price appreciation of, of gold over time. The other is the diversification benefit. And of course, the, the income opportunities through companies like Monetary Metals. What are some of your, your final thoughts here on terms of the inflation hedge versus the the safe haven value or the safe haven narrative as we come into 2024 and end 2024 heading into 2025? Well, I definitely think the safe haven uh, narrative is stronger because I think that the, the inflation hedge is just empirically, historically not 100% accurate. I mean, it's somewhat correlated, but it's not precisely correlated. Uh, but more importantly, I you know, obviously we in, in this company and a lot of people in our broader community, uh, we want to see gold retain or regain some of its role in the global monetary system as a financial asset, as a monetary asset. Uh, I don't think governments or central banks are going to go back to a gold standard anytime soon. Uh, and I do think the the real competitor or the real wrestling match at this point is between gold and Bitcoin. Uh, my thoughts on that are a little different than Keith Wieners, but nonetheless, I'm a I'm a very avid spectator, uh, and and so I think the idea that there's at, at today's dollar price some 15 trillion dollars worth of physical gold apart from the paper market uh, just laying around, you know, that could be a, a highly productive asset in the economy, whether being used as collateral, whether being used as finance for production, you know, whatever it might be. In other words, pulling some of that monetary value out of gold. And, and, and I'll, I'll finish with this. I do think gold still has monetary value in the public's mind, in central bankers' mind. And, I'll, and, I'll, and that's, I think, proven in the marketplace for, for a very simple reason. Why does gold trade? It's you know some $2,300 per ounce as of today's uh, show taping. Well, if gold had no monetary value, as you know, Ben Bernanke famously told Ron Paul, well, central banks just hold it because of tradition. And, uh, you know, and so Ron said, why don't they hold diamonds? Um, you know, it still has some monetary value for the, and, and I think that's proved by this. If we reduced it simply to its use value as a commodity, which would basically be jewelry and industrial uses, would gold fetch 2,300 US dollars? I think the answer to that is no. So there's some premium baked in that the market sets for its monetary use above and beyond its, its mere commodity uses. And so that monetary use reflects this idea of maybe an inflation hedge, reflects this idea of a store of value, reflects the idea that central banks hold it, uh, reflects the idea that it historically has never really gone to zero. Uh, it reflects the idea that gold is very, very liquid. Uh, it's as liquid, at least in an ETF or something, it's as liquid as your your stocks and bonds, it's certainly more liquid than real estate, uh, and and I think even in physical form it's somewhat liquid. You can go to your local bullion dealer or pawn dealer, and there, you know it depends on on the instant supply and demand, which is why we say you know what's the gold price? Well, there's the LBMA London fixed price every twice a day. Now that very much is the paper market price, but when it comes to the physical price, you know that's almost saying, well, what's the real estate price? It depends on your neighborhood, it depends on your city, it depends. You know that that's very very localized, but uh, it it is this stubborn monetary value, which gold, which is reflected in its dollar price per ounce, which I think shows that the world still thinks, regardless of what they say. Regardless of what politicians and bankers say, the world still thinks on some level that gold has value as a monetary asset. And I think 
uh, you know, we really ought to tap into that and be using gold uh, to help people finance productive things in this world. Jeff Dice, thank you so much. For those of you interested in earning a yield on gold paid in gold, check out monetary-metals.com. We'll see you next time. Thanks, Ben. This episode was brought to you by Monetary Metals. Monetary Metals is a different kind of gold company. Others buy and sell gold. Monetary Metals operates the Gold Yield Marketplace, a platform of products that offer a yield on gold paid in gold to investors and institutions, and are gold financing simplified, reliable financing denominated in gold with a built-in hedge for gold using and gold producing businesses. To learn more, visit www.monetary-metals.com. See you next time.